All right, hello everyone. It is 11 o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to today's webinar, which is brought to you by the Northwest ATTC, the Pacific Southwest ATTC, and the Western States Node of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network. Before we get started, I have just a few little housekeeping things to go over. First, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. Dr. Mooney may answer some as she goes, and then the rest will be answered at the end during the Q&A. Next, when you registered for today's event, you selected the type of continuing education credits you wanted to receive. If you selected CME, you'll get an email within three business days and a link to use to take an evaluation and attest to your hours and then your transcript will be updated with your credits. If you have questions about CME, there's an email address on the slide there, and these slides will be sent out immediately after the webinar today, so you have all this information. And there's a little basic information about the CME accreditation, which you can read when you get the slides later today as well. If you selected one of the other types of CE credits, you'll get an email with a link to a course evaluation, and once you submit that, your certificate will be emailed to you within six to eight weeks. For questions on CE credits, there's an email on the slide there as well. And then finally, if you selected the certificate of attendance option rather than CME or a specific type of CE credit, the Northwest ATTC will be sending you that certificate to your email address within about a week. All right, finally, shortly after today's webinar, you'll be receiving an email from the Northwest ATTC that has our extremely brief survey in it, as well as a link to the slides and a link to where you can find the recording of this webinar, which will be available later this week. Thank you in advance for taking our short little survey that helps us out a lot with future programming. And with that, we are ready to get started. Today's webinar, Meth 2.0 and Opioid Use Disorder, A Collision of Epidemics, is being presented by Larissa Mooney, MD. Dr. Mooney is a board certified addiction psychiatrist and associate clinical professor of psychiatry at UCLA. She's also director of the UCLA Addiction Psychiatry Clinic and chief of the Greater Los Angeles Substance Use Disorders section. Dr. Mooney has conducted research at UCLA integrated substance abuse programs on pharmacological and behavioral treatment interventions for addictive disorders, and is also one of two PIs for the NIDA Clinical Trials Network's Greater Southern California Node. And with that, um, I will hand control over to you, Dr. Mooney. Okay, thank you. I seem to have control now. Hopefully everyone can hear and see me. Um, I'm really happy to be here and, and um, and grateful for the invitation to talk about such an important and timely topic, certainly one that I'm seeing in my clinical work at UCLA and the Greater Los Angeles VA, where I have a joint appointment. And so what I'll be presenting today is um, informed by my own clinical experience and practice and uh, you know, synthesis of some of the literature in this area, and hopefully can spark some questions and discussion at the end about future directions and, and maybe issues that, that you're seeing or wondering about in your own clinical work. I understand this is a, a fairly multidisciplinary audience, most likely. So I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest today. However, I will be discussing some use of off-label medications, particularly for methamphetamine use disorder for which we have no approved medications. I also want to acknowledge, um, you know, some colleagues who have shared slides with me, we've, you know, swapped slides over the years. And in particular, uh, Mickey McCann has created some of the slides on contingency management and some of the other um, psychosocial treatment studies. And my colleague and mentor, Dr. Rick Rawson, who really is an expert in this field and area and has been presenting on, on um, this and methamphetamine use disorder uh, across the nation. So for learning objectives, we will be discussing um, epidemiological trends in methamphetamine and opioid use. Also a uh, goal of identifying potential medical risks and complications of methamphetamine and opioid use, 
and evidence-based treatment approaches that may be utilized in patients who use both of these substances. Now my slides are not advancing. Okay, there we go. Uh, I've outlined my talk mostly as follows, focusing first on the opioid epidemic and treatment for opioid use disorder, and then followed by what I'm calling methamphetamine 2.0 or, or more potent meth that we're seeing today and epidemiology of stimulant overdose and methamphetamine and opioid co-use and overdose, and then uh, shifting to methamphetamine use disorder treatment approaches and really treatment approaches that you might think about for most, most, both of those disorders. So for the opioid epidemic, many of you have perhaps seen this slide showing the three waves in the opioid epidemic that we've seen first in this country with a rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths, followed by a rise in heroin overdose deaths, and more recently a rise in overdose deaths related to synthetic opioids, which are very potent. And just for some more recent statistics and comparison that also link with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2018, the number of opioid related overdose deaths was four times higher than in 1999. And we saw in that year over 67,000 drug overdose deaths in the US with more than two thirds linked to opioids and a 10% increase in fentanyl and analogs um, in the prior year. Statistics from 2020 are even more concerning. And this again, overlaps with the COVID-19 pandemic where we know there's been a rise in overdose deaths with over 81,000 overdose deaths in this country. Um, from June 2019 to, to May of the following year, and a 38.4% increase in synthetic opioid overdose deaths. So that's very concerning and alarming, and uh, we cannot forget about this, this um, epidemic, even though understandably a lot of focus has been on the, the COVID pandemic. This is a graph depicting some of the same really showing that dramatic sharp increase in synthetic opioid related overdose deaths, but also notice here um, significant rise in the past few years in stimulant associated overdose deaths. And importantly, there are some uh, racial disparities and, and differences in what we're seeing in terms of overdose deaths in different um, individuals. We know that opioid overdose deaths have increased among minority groups, and this includes Blacks and Hispanics who have historically had lower rates of opioid overdose deaths. Um, Black Americans have had the steepest increase in rate compared to other populations between 2013 and 2017, with an 18-fold increase in mortality due to synthetic opioids. But we've also seen a rise in rate across other groups. Hispanics had a 12.3 fold increase and whites 9.2 fold increase during that same time period. In this recent paper published by Fur Holden showing annual percent change in overdose deaths during different time periods compared between African-Americans and white Americans. Um, this really shows a difference in the rate of change in overdose deaths during these different periods whereby whites had the greatest change and increase from 2013 to 2016, but in more recent time periods, this rate has increased um, more sharply among African-Americans. So now shifting gears to talk about treatment of opioid use disorder. When we think about using medication treatments, Approved medications are for relapse prevention and we really view them as maintenance treatments. They, have the, they are our greatest tool to reduce relapse and more importantly, overdose fatality. We also use medications for medically assisted withdrawal management, also known as detox. However, this really is not considered a standalone treatment. It's relevant certainly if we are transitioning individuals onto 
injectable long-acting naltrexone, for example, where we need supportive medications to manage very uncomfortable withdrawal symptoms. But we're going to focus on the approved medication treatments, which also can be very effectively combined with psychosocial treatment, behavioral interventions, and um, really want to think about always developing individualized comprehensive treatment approaches for our patients. So again, why not detox alone? We don't want to send individuals just for opioid detox because rates of relapse after detox with no follow-up treatment are extraordinarily high, approaching 100% within the first 90 days. So that's really not a treatment plan that should be considered. Talk a bit about buprenorphine, which has um, been approved since 2002 and more recently, there's been updated HHS guidelines. We do need an X waiver. Prescribers need an X number to linked with their DEA to prescribe buprenorphine. This used to involve a training requirement, but now for individuals who wish to treat up to 30 patients with buprenorphine, they still need to file a notice of intent with SAMHSA and obtain the X number, but the training re requirement has been eliminated just very recently. However, if prescribing for more than 30 patients, training requirements um, are, are still mandatory, eight hours for physicians, 24 for NPs and PAs. Buprenorphine has a unique mechanism of action that really uh, facilitated our ability to um, have this medication approved for office-based treatment. It's a partial agonist at the mu receptor. And, um, it therefore has a, a higher safety profile than traditional full mu opioid agonists because it's safer in overdose and has a plateau effect. So just by moving this medication to an office-based setting, it really um, enabled a totally different uh, way of treating individuals with opioid use disorder. And what you see here are some dose response curves for buprenorphine versus methadone or any other full mu agonist, basically showing that um, above 32 milligrams per day, there's a ceiling effect of buprenorphine above which you don't see additional respiratory depression, sedation, and other mu agonist effects. So again, it is a medication that's safer in overdose than traditional full mu agonists. Buprenorphine has a very strong receptor affinity um, long duration of action. So it binds strongly to the receptors. And as a result, in order to avoid precipitating withdrawal, this is a medication that is given after an individual has demonstrated or exhibited some initial symptoms of opioid withdrawal. Because otherwise, if you give it in the presence of other opioids, you can essentially kick them off the receptor and cause opioid withdrawal. However, with the caveat that there are some newer induction strategies being utilized like uh, microdosing that enable very small doses of buprenorphine to be given together with other opioids. And um, these are becoming increasingly popular in clinical practice. But traditional induction, it starts after withdrawal has begun. We won't go through all of these formulations. I'm including them here just to show that buprenorphine is available in multiple formulations and dosing regimens, and often in combination with naloxone. Buprenorphine is bioavailable sublingually. Naloxone is not, or let's say much, much less so. And therefore, uh, if, if the combination product is crushed or injected, then naloxone is present. It's really was built in as a abuse deterrent um, strategy. Also want to mention that there's a newer monthly subcutaneous injection formulation of buprenorphine that's been approved. Um, brand name Sublocade, though there's other, I, I'm including the brand name here really because there are, um, is another subcutaneous injectable formulation that's been um, sort of tentatively approved. It's not available just yet. That will be available in weekly and monthly form. 
But in this approved formulation, which we started to use in, in some of our clinics, um, you can basically switch someone who, particularly those who are having problems with adherence, maybe they're not doing well on sublingual or um, they could benefit from and, and are interested in a subcutaneous injection that will uh, last for a month and they, that avoids needing to take daily dosing of sublingual product. And it's usually dose 300 milligrams for the first two months, followed by um, maintenance dose of hundred per month. So there's some off-label clinical variation in how this is done. To be able to uh, distribute buprenorphine, prescribe it, there's a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy that um, clinics need to register with so that this medication doesn't get in the hands uh, of patients. Shifting gears now to extended release injectable naltrexone, another approved medication for opioid use disorder. Again, these are our best tools, very uh, strong evidence and, and um, gold standard treatment for opioid use disorder. This is a medication that's given as a 380 milligram injection in the deep gluteal muscle every month, alternating signs to sides to avoid injection site reactions. When naltrexone is in the system, this is an opioid antagonist, so it's going to block the effects of exogenously administered opioids. And therefore, for somebody who will need to be on full opioid agonist for a pain condition, this wouldn't be the best choice. Uh, we use this in conjunction in our VA site. We have a, a residential facility on, on site, a domiciliary, where we can readily move patients there to be inducted on naltrexone because it requires some days, about a week or so of uh, opioid free state, which for some individuals can be difficult to maintain as an outpatient. So if you have access to a facility that can do this as an, you know, on an inpatient setting, it just gives more options and flexibility to induct patients onto this medication, usually well tolerated, and um, like also approved for alcohol use disorder and, and side effects include nausea and vomiting, maybe as most common transient effects early in treatment. If need be, this blockade can be overridden in a medically monitored setting. Someone who needs emergency surgery, for example, uh, we, we provide a lot of education about different options with all of these medications. And of course, I will talk about methadone, which has been around for decades and is a very effective treatment for opioid use disorder. Methadone can be prescribed for pain, but on a prescription, but when given for opioid use disorder, it needs to be dispensed from a federally licensed clinic. So this limits availability to methadone. Unfortunately, in many areas of the country, they may not have access to a methadone clinic or individuals may live too far from a methadone clinic. So it, it is tightly regulated. And in fact, you know, in the first 90 days of, of um, treatment, individuals need to line up every day and get their dose dispensed in clinic, which is an additional barrier. And they can earn over time if, they're, if they are responding and doing well in treatment, take home doses. But with once daily dosing, reduction in withdrawal symptoms and cravings are present for a full day. And what you see here is the typical cycle of dosing of opioids throughout the day, multiple times a day, short acting opioids such as heroin. And individuals are in this cycle of using, withdrawing, recovering, dosing again. And uh, in the presence of methadone, you can maintain a fairly steady serum level for 24 hours and break that cycle. The public health data for methadone are replicated in many studies in many countries and are really robust and convincing that methadone improves life expectancy, reduces overdose deaths, infectious disease transmission, mortality from untreated heroin use disorder, 
um, is very significant. Lifespan can be reduced on the average of about 15 years. So these are really important tools that we have. And, and there's often um, some stigma and ideas in, in the community that you're just substituting one drug for another, but really what we're doing is saving lives and allowing individuals to function, resume productivity, go back to work, reduce rates of incarceration. There have been different papers and studies that have attempted to compare effectiveness of these medications. Um, you might be wondering, well, what does one work better than the other? And, and bottom line is we need to individualize care and we're very fortunate that we have a few options and we can look at a patient's history of response, what treatments have worked, what have they failed, what are their comorbidities, what treatments do they have access to? when deciding which of these medications to recommend. Um, in a meta-analysis published by Matic, Cochrane Review, methadone was slightly more effective than buprenorphine in retaining patients in treatment with the caveat that at high fixed doses, buprenorphine seems to be equally effective, but flexible doses and lower fixed doses, and certainly flexible doses are more common in clinical practice, Methadone has an advantage in retention, but they're equally effective in reducing opioid use, relapse to opioids, and especially at buprenorphine given doses above 16 milligrams a day. There was a NIDA clinical trials network study called XBOT that compared um, randomized open label extended release naltrexone versus buprenorphine for 24 weeks. And in a nutshell, induction rates were lower for naltrexone than buprenorphine, 72% versus 94. Again, with some, sometimes some um, challenges getting people on the medication, but once on it, relapse rates were equivalent. There's also an interesting uh, paper published by Wakeman in 2020, a retrospective comparative effectiveness study using claims data where different treatment pathways were compared, detox inpatient, residential, structured intensive outpatient, behavioral treatment only, also um, general behavioral treatment outpatient, and then also methadone or buprenorphine versus naltrexone. So looking at over 40,000 claims of individuals with OUD and characterizing differences in overdose and other um, um, negative outcomes related to uh, opioid use disorder, focusing on the three and 12 month time points. And, and in this claims data analysis, um, methadone and buprenorphine were associated with reduced overdose and OUD related morbidity compared with naltrexone, also with some of the other, um, the other treatment arms like behavioral treatment only. When discussing opioid use disorder treatment, certainly important to mention naloxone, an important tool that we now have that we're being encouraged to prescribe for anyone with risk of overdose from opioids. This is a, a short acting opioid antagonist that can rapidly reverse the effects of opioid overdose. It, it works within minutes. Um, the effects are also short acting. So if somebody is on a long acting opioid or a highly potent opi opioid, you may need to give multiple doses of naloxone. But really this is now becoming um, a public health tool, there's a, a goal and it was put forth by the Surgeon General that more Americans should have naloxone on hand and we're encouraged to prescribe naloxone for anyone with opioid overdose risk factors. That can be used by um, friends, family members, bystanders, and it's most mostly now prescribed in the intranasal formulation rather than intramuscular injection but it's really uh, available in multiple routes of administration. There's a website prescribedtoprevent.org that discusses 
uh, there are many, many resources, uh, YouTube videos, you name it, but um, how, to, how to prescribe it, how to use it, the ideas you give it in conjunction with patient education on when to administer it, but it's really considered a very safe medication. So overdose risk factors include any history of prior overdose. That's a major risk factor for future overdose. Anyone who's on more than 50 milligram oral morphine equivalents for chronic pain, for example, anyone with an opioid use disorder, if they're on medication treatment or not, should have access to this medication. Of note, um, in California, pharmacies can dispense this without a prescription. They need to show interest and you know, register to be able to do this. But um, there are some resources where you can just enter the zip code and find pharmacies that will dispense it even without a doctor's prescription. Also, anyone who's taking an opioid in combination with alcohol, benzodiazepines, other CNS depressants, or, or who has pulmonary risk, risk factors. Again, I want to emphasize that all of these medication treatments can be successfully and effectively combined with psychosocial treatment modalities and also with 12-step mutual support groups, AA, NA. I will tell my patients really about all tools available to them that I'm aware of and, and try to help them develop a more comprehensive treatment plan that addresses their behavioral and psychosocial needs, getting involved with um, spiritual resources, family supports, and 12-step and groups can help them build a community. Cognitive behavioral therapy, contingency management, motivational interviewing, 12-step facilitation, these are some of the evidence-based behavioral treatment interventions that we have. Um, many of which are manualized and can be replicated and have been studied across substance use disorders. The other value of, um, actually what I wanna mention is that given that the medication treatment for opioid use disorder really is gold standard, it's, it's our number one tool. And if, if a patient is not interested in, not able to engage in psychosocial treatment, we shouldn't withhold medication treatment. That is the foundation. It has very robust effects, even without additional psychosocial treatment. But certainly many of our patients have psychiatric comorbidity, psychiatric symptoms, social issues, and other co-occurring substance use disorders that could benefit from additional behavioral interventions. Also want to highlight that there are some many, there are many innovative programs happening with buprenorphine in multiple settings and an interest in general in moving addiction treatment into general healthcare settings, integrating treatment in general healthcare settings where patients are most likely to present. They are most likely to seek care for their back pain, their diabetes, their hypertension. It's a real opportunity for multiple disciplines to just open up that dialogue, do some kind of either brief screening assessment or incorporate it into their history taking. And to the extent that we can identify substance use disorders, initiate treatment within other settings, and then link patients with specialty care, either because their disorder is complex, they are um, treatment refractory, or they, they need more support than what a general medical setting can provide. This is where we can really work collaboratively and in an interdisciplinary fashion. So in this one landmark study, there you know, has been really a movement now to initiate buprenorphine in emergency departments where individuals may present with other medical consequences of their opioid use disorder. They may be in withdrawal present with an abscess, cardiac issue. And um, in this uh, study published by Gail D'Onofrio, where buprenorphine was initiated in the ED and then patients were linked with substance use disorder clinic or another clinic that could prescribe buprenorphine, 
those who received the buprenorphine in the ED were twice as likely to be engaged in addiction treatment one month later relative to those just given a referral. Uh, I've seen in my own facilities and in the ED at our VA, we had a very successful launch of a bup ED program with our ED physicians who started this and were able to directly schedule patients into our outpatient SUD clinic within three days, and they, they gave them a loading dose. Um, so also from personal experience, I've seen this work, and we just want to catch people where they're at, where they're showing up, and, and when they're maybe vulnerable or open to consider treatment. And then this was uh, highlighted in a, in a New York Times article around that time. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk about methamphetamine, but again, we're gonna bring it all together at the end. Methamphetamine 2.0 is a, a term that's been coined in some um, you know, news segments, newspaper articles as just this more potent form of methamphetamine with um, also greater consequences being seen in terms of a rise in use and overdose deaths related to methamphetamine. And what, we, what we've seen over the years is that the purity of methamphetamine is increasing, whereas the cost is going down or at least staying low, which will you know, drive use and access to this um, substance. And much of the methamphetamine that um, is coming in from Mexico and manufactured in Mexico has these uh, characteristics of, of a rising purity which um, is associated with you know, more potential potency and, and medical consequences and addiction potential. This graph just shows a comparison of purity of meth seized in early 2000s versus recent years with 97% or so purity. And, and again, as I mentioned, there's a whole host of consequences that may come with with greater purity and, and low cost of this substance, potential adverse consequences and, and greater access to this um, drug. The P2P method replaced the more common use of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine-based precursors that were banned. In 2005, there was a Combat Methamphetamine Act that really started removing uh, Sudafed products. But this P2P method is a different uh, way of making methamphetamine that increases the purity. So there's fewer contaminants and, and other compounds. And um, in terms of seizures, we're seeing over the years greater rates of meth made in this um, P2P method. Also important to talk about racial and ethnic disparities and, and differences in um, how this use is affecting different populations in the United States. And importantly, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native populations have currently the highest rate of overdose deaths related to primarily methamphetamine or psychostimulants. There's been an increase in the rate of overdose deaths across multiple populations in recent years, white, Hispanic, black, but especially hard hit our uh, AIAN population. So now I'm going to shift and talk a bit about methamphetamine treatment, but also um, meth and OUD related consequences. We've seen an eight times increase in overdose death rate involving psychostimulants in the past few years, methamphetamine and cocaine. In many cases, these are also uh, in combination with opioids, particularly fentanyl. Methamphetamine and cocaine may be, and is more and more commonly laced with fentanyl. And even before it enters the United States, there's more and more fentanyl in methamphetamine that's being sold, but it can also be added uh, particularly to cocaine at the more local level. And so this is a real, I mean, this is a true combination of epidemics that are becoming very intertwined. There's 
higher rates of overdose due to this, you know, potent synthetic opioids and now more potent stimulants and then stimulants laced with fentanyl. So increasingly we need treatment approaches that will address both disorders and co-use simultaneously. Um, this slide really combines some of the other figures that you've seen showing this shift in overdose fatality and what's driving the overdose rates. And certainly though there's still total great, you know, total numbers of fentanyl related deaths and other synthetics, stimulants are, are really sharply rising. And um, many are in combination, many of the deaths are, are stimulants and opioids in combination. For example, in 2017, approximately 15% of all drug overdose deaths involved methamphetamine, and about half of those also involved an opioid. That was several years ago. Rates are even higher for cocaine. And this table shows some comparisons in overdose deaths in the COVID-19 pandemic, comparing overdose fatalities between 2019 and 2020, and the rate of change, the rate of increase, which if you see along the bottom in red is most pronounced for synthetic opioids, but also um, very high increase in psychostimulants, which again is mostly methamphetamine, at 39% increase in just one year, um, and then cocaine 29%. You may be thinking, well, what about if patients are already on medication treatment for opioid use disorder? How does that intersect with methamphetamine use? There's uh, radars data, survey data um, published demonstrating that prevalence of methamphetamine use is increasing among individuals entering treatment programs. So medication opioid treatment programs uh, where they are endorsing higher rates of past month methamphetamine use between 2012 and 2018 and um, with, with really high rates in the, um, the Midwest, also increasing rates in the South and West, but we're seeing the highest rates in the, in the Western states. That's also where there's the highest prevalence of methamphetamine use. And again, what we're calling twin epidemics, other uh, studies supporting that past month use of methamphetamine is significantly increasing among treatment seeking opioid users with an increase in 82.6% in this paper, um, between 2011 and 2017. I certainly am seeing this clinically myself, and it's uh, an issue that we're getting a lot of questions about, you know, and, and multidisciplinary discussion about how to handle it. How does that affect treatment plans with their medications for opioid use disorder, their uh, take-home dosing for methadone? These kind of clinical questions are arising in how to address these co-occurring uh, use. This is just a figure from the same paper showing that increase in trend in methamphetamine use in those who are um, treatment seeking for opioid use. And when you talk to patients, and again, many of you may have other experiences or, or issues that you would highlight, but uh, there's a potential synergistic effect that occurs when you use methamphetamine and an opioid together, a kind of a peak effect in the first 90 minutes. They feel different when they use both together than they do when they use one alone. And again, sometimes they're not aware that there's fentanyl in the stimulant that they are using. Other times there is a decision made that they are choosing to co-use both together. Sometimes it's to diminish the side effects of the other substance. Um, the idea of combining an upper and a downer, you're too tired, take a stimulant, can feel more alert, or having a hard time sleeping on the stimulant, take something like an opioid um, to come down from that effect. So really many different reasons for co-use. I've certainly seen in Los Angeles, 
where we were behind the curve with fentanyl. I had colleagues on the East Coast really dealing with that issue and we were starting to test for fentanyl and not really seeing much of it. Now we're seeing it a lot and more and more of our patients are saying that they've switched to fentanyl from other opioids. They are seeking fentanyl and shoot, you know, that's their opioid of choice, which brings up also different treatment issues for the opioid use disorder itself. But there's an increase in overdose risk when you have now a substance that causes respiratory depression, can shut down breathing, and now another one that has cardiac effects really with stimulants. Uh, they are vasoconstrictors as stimulants, they raise heart rate, blood pressure. And so you can see as uh, cardiac consequences, arrhythmias or acute myocardial infarction, coronary syndromes. So together there's additive risk when these are co-ingested. This also has implications for treatment retention and dropout. Despite our robust medications that we have now to treat opioid use disorder, they're really effective. They're not perfect. They, um, no, no treatment that we have is, and that's why we get creative and plan A doesn't work, try plan B or um, try different combinations of approaches and really try to form that comprehensive plan. The problem that we have with the, the medication treatments for opioid use disorder is treatment retention and also ongoing um, relapse while on the medication treatment and adherence to the medication treatment itself. So we know that, for example, about 50% of individuals who have been initiated on medication treatment for opioid use disorder are still using opioids or, or um, dropping out of treatment by six months. When you now have a methamphetamine use disorder, stimulant use disorder co-occurring, this can have implications, further additive implications for treatment retention and dropout. And in this recent um, systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2020, they looked at psychosocial substance use disorder treatment, dropout rates in the first 90 days, combining 151 studies with thousands of participants, and um, looked at dropout rates and predictors of dropout. And when broken down by, by primary substance and compared across them, methamphetamine has the highest rate of treatment dropout uh, with cocaine close behind. So stimulant use disorder, um, individuals with these disorders are not retained as well in treatment. Apologies, my landline is ringing. Um, and, and then alcohol, tobacco, heroin, have uh, you know lower rates of treatment dropout. So this brings up the question, well, if somebody's on medication treatment for opioid use disorder, do they have increased uh, risk of treatment dropout or poor retention in treatment? And indeed, there's some early work showing that this may be the case. Adults receiving buprenorphine in a Washington state clinics um, between 2015 and 2018. In this uh, study, 30% of individuals reported use of methamphetamine at admission, and this baseline methamphetamine use was associated with more than twice the um, relative hazard of dropout. So I'm curious if others are, are, are seeing this or maybe other challenges when treating these disorders simultaneously. This was the survival, survival curve from that paper showing uh, you know, days in treatment compared between those who do not use methamphetamine, which is the top solid line, and those who were using methamphetamine at baseline, which is the dotted line, and um, survival or, or retention continuation and treatment was higher for those who do not use methamphetamine. In a sample of over 500 participants at a Washington state syringe exchange program, there was a survey conducted on attitudes about stopping drug use. And I think the findings are very interesting and also consistent with what I've experienced in my own clinical practice. 
82% of individuals who reported opioids as their primary substance expressed an interest in reducing or stopping opioid use, whereas 46% of individuals who reported methamphetamine as their primary substance expressed an interest in reducing or stopping. I, um, as rough numbers would agree with this in terms of uh, patients in our substance use disorder programs, um, at times being very motivated to quit or being on be on medication treatment for opioid use disorder, but do not want to give up their stimulant use. And again, we, we meet them where they're at. We work with them. We see if over time with motivational uh, approaches, they may, their, their goals may change over time, but they may not view it as the, the major consequence or the, the main driver of why they're seeking treatment. For uh, unlike opioid use disorder, for methamphetamine use disorder treatment, behavioral interventions are the gold standard. We have no FDA approved medications to treat methamphetamine use disorder. I've listed here a variety of evidence-based treatments for substance use disorders, some of which have more or less evidence specific to stimulant use disorder, but I, I listed them earlier. So um, I'll just add here community reinforcement approach, which is an approach that aims to encourage individuals to find uh, non drug using activities that can be rewarding and reinforcement re reinforcing in place of um, drug using activities. And, and then cognitive behavioral therapy can teach relapse prevention skills. We'll talk about continuity management more in a moment. Um, with some emerging evidence for exercise also to target depression and anxiety. And again, really readily combined with 12 step mutual support and as clinicians, we always think about what level of care is appropriate. You can use the ACM criteria or clinical assessment and judgment to decide if you're going to recommend general outpatient, intensive outpatient, residential treatment, or a medically monitored setting. So for, for non-pharmacological interventions, behavioral treatment interventions, there was a, a systematic review published with the strong conclusion that while continuity management interventions showed the strongest evidence favoring the outcomes assessed, CBT or CBT with CM was also effective. So this is for methamphetamine use disorder. CM, continuity management, is our most robust, most effective treatment, but most underutilized. There have been uh, challenges implementing CM in in many treatment settings, sometimes caps on the amount of reimbursement uh, possible to actually um, provide incentives for, for patients. CM is the use of reinforcers to, or incentives to increase the behavior that you would like to change. And most classically for continuity management, urine drug screens are targeted. So if you're doing continuity management for stimulant use disorder and you collect the urine drug screen, if it's negative, the individual earns a voucher or reward, something like um, a gift card, for example. And there, there's different ways to implement CM. Again, I will include some of this in, in subsequent slides. You can also incentivize treatment adherence, showing up for visits, really a, a whole host of um, behavioral targets, but the idea is you're giving some kind of reward or incentive. Contingency management is unanimously supported in reviews. Um, there's also evidence for CBT and community reinforcement approach, sometimes in combination with CM. Motivational interviewing is broadly applicable across substance use disorders. It's a very effective tool to facilitate uh, um, change and, and continue to reassess goals, less specific evidence or robust evidence specifically for stimulant use disorder. And again, some recent uh, emerging evidence supporting exercise for methamphetamine use disorder and some of the 
uh, other outcomes like depression and anxiety. So I've covered, and I apologize for a minor typo here that I, I couldn't correct in time, but um, we, we've discussed what CM is at our local VA. We have a voucher system where patients can take um, a gift card that they can exchange at the canteen for food or other supplies and gifts. I'm not going to go into extensive detail on the study supporting CM, but, and a couple of the studies are related to cocaine use disorder as opposed to methamphetamine use disorder. So I'm, I'm including stimulant use disorder more broadly, but I'm including these really to just highlight that there have been many studies done supporting contingency management, often in combination with other treatments. In this one study, the effectiveness of CM and CBT alone or in combination for cocaine dependence uh, with patients receiving methadone treatment. So again, this idea of how do we target both disorders simultaneously, for opioid use disorder patients on methadone, there have been studies combining CM to target the stimulant use in combination with methadone for the opioid use. And in this study, participants were randomly assigned to receive CM, CBT, the combination of CM and CBT, or just standard methadone treatment as usual uh, as a 16 week intervention. And in short, the groups randomized to receive CM or CBT plus CM had more cocaine-free urine drug screens than methadone management alone. So there's evidence supporting adding CM within an opioid treatment program to target stimulant use in particular. During the treatment phase, the 16 weeks, the CBT alone was uh, not significant in terms of its uh, effect. So during that study period, it was the CM conditions that had the most robust effect in being associated with reduced uh, cocaine use. And there was no additive effect that was significant with CBT plus CM. It wasn't you know, substantially better than, than CM alone. So either CM condition was effective. But at the 26 and 52 week follow-up time points after the active intervention period, both self-report and urine screens reflected an improvement in all three intervention groups. So again, showing that there is uh, some benefit of CBT and potentially uh, carry, carry forward effect. As I mentioned before, there are different methods of delivering CM, you know, testing the urine and, and giving some kind of fixed reward. There's also approaches that um, attempt to have different levels of reward to lower the overall total cost of the intervention at the end, and, and also just tapping into to different types of reinforcement. So there's a, an approach called the fishbowl approach, which we also use at our local VA, where uh, patients will draw cards out of a fishbowl if they have a negative urine test. And the majority just say, good job. Some of them are very low value, like a dollar. Some are valued at a lower percentage, are valued at more like $20. And then there's some bigger rewards that are, you know, harder to draw because there are fewer of them in the bowl, but that's worth 80 to hundred dollars. But over the course of the intervention and, and what happens is the, um, the patients who continue to test negative sequentially earn more draws. So you earn greater number of draws if your urine tests are negative in a row and, and they can earn, you know, several hundred dollars over the course of the intervention. And, and it's, it's very, very effective. So in this one study um, done by the NIDA Clinical Trials Network, they used this approach that also looked at cost of the intervention. Again, knowing that CM has limited real world impl implementation, how do 
programs pay for the CM if they're going to administer the CM. And this was a multi-site study across methadone clinics with stimulant use as the target using OTPs and participants were randomly assigned to either CM with the intermittent reinforcement schedule or fishbowl method or treatment as usual. And what this study demonstrated again was that negative samples were twice as likely for CM than for treatment as usual, which is just the straightforward opioid treatment program with methadone. And that the um, achieving four or more or eight or more or 12 or more weeks of continuous abstinence was significantly higher among those randomized to the CM condition, three, nine, and 11 times more likely respectively the average cost of prizes was 120 per participant. So this can be done in um, a fairly low cost way. And this is a, a figure from that, that study showing the difference in the those who are incentivized with CM, which is the top line with the black triangles versus usual care, uh, the, the circles, and showing greater percent of stimulant negative urine drug screens across the entire intervention period. In this study, really just bringing this up for an approach, combining medication plus CM for stimulant use disorder in buprenorphine maintained patients. Um, this was a 12 week trial combining dizipramine or placebo plus CM and essentially the cocaine-free and combined opioid and cocaine-free urines were increased more rapidly over time in those treated with either medication or CM. And those receiving both interventions had more substance-free urines than the other three treatment groups. I'm including this again to bring up the idea that in terms of future research directions, we may have opportunities to combine medication and behavioral treatment and evaluate differences in outcomes or efficacy than either alone. In this new digital age, I just want to mention that there are different companies that have either uh, used, already, meaning they already have on market or developing app-based contingency management, separate from the, the policy-related issues, bringing CM into more treatment programs in general. And um, in fact, the Biden-Harris drug policy priorities specifically say that they want to increase adoption and support for contingency management. But now after, uh, during, and, and I don't wanna say after uh, COVID, um, we've seen more telehealth, more virtual care and more demand for this and more success with this. We hope uh, you know the research in this area will continue to support it. But there's really more interest and demand for integration of digitally supported treatment interventions, whether they be delivered over the computer or via an app, anything where somebody could use their phone to either get on a visit with a provider or receive behavioral interventions really is very uh, novel, innovative, and, and maybe meeting the needs of individuals who have treatment barriers getting to clinic, coming in person, or going to multiple visits across clinics. So there's a movement in, in finding ways to deliver evidence-based behavioral interventions via technology, whether it be computer or phones. There are barriers to that technology that I really want to acknowledge. There are geographic, racial, ethnic barriers, socioeconomic, where some areas of the country don't have sufficient broadband to connect, um, may not have the, the, the devices or the tech literacy. So it's really a lot of issues that we need to address at the same time because some of the groups or populations for which this could be most effective also need support to access these technologies. But I'm, I'm not here to support or endorse any one um, app-based treatment. And in fact, I don't have a lot of personal experience using any of these. Um, I'm becoming more knowledgeable and familiar with them. But for example, there are um, you know, dynamic care, reset, we connect are examples of 
app-based um, systems that can support contingency management as well as other behavioral intervention components like CBT modules, educational modules, um, even connection with groups, networking, and, and some capacity for remote drug testing and incentivizing for treatment module attendance or visit attendance, as well as submission of negative urine tests. There are also telemedicine groups that are doing this, um, found a way to you know, send out urine tests that can be viewed over the screen. Um, really create, the idea that I'm just trying to stimulate creative thought about this and, and curious about your own experiences using any of these. And this is just a, a, you know, a picture of, of some of the different modules used in one of them um, and how it can work where you can access different, you know, get reminders for appointments and find ways of tracking medication adherence by taking pictures or videos. And they can be more individualized with the provider also being able to interact and interface with these platforms. So keeping an eye on the time, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. I will mention briefly some off-label medication treatments for methamphetamine use disorder. I view pharmacotherapy again as a tool. We have no approved medications. When I'm selecting medications, many of our, our patients who use stimulants, of course, um, also have other co-occurring disorders or symptoms, depression, anxiety, and, and some of the medications that have been studied, that this has been an area of study for decades, and none of the medications are very robust, but there have been some signals, some positive signals in the literature that would suggest maybe in some subgroups that we need to do a better job of identifying and characterizing. These medications could help reduce relapse to methamphetamine use. And so when I'm, when I'm thinking about a medication in this population, I try to look at the comorbidities and the symptoms that they're the presenting symptoms and try to get two birds with one stone. So for example, there's some signals for bupropion um, for methamphetamine use disorder. If I have a patient with depression, poor concentration, low energy, I might use the bupropion for their major depression and, and hope that it might also help them in their goal of, of reducing or quitting meth use. Uh, similarly, signals for mirtazapine, couple of studies, which is an antidepressant that has some benefit for sleep, anxiety. And so if, if those are strong presenting symptoms, I might select that medication for the psychiatric symptoms, but also knowing that there could be some support for reduction in relapse to meth use. So we'll talk about a couple of these, also a recent trial of injectable naltrexone in combination with bupropion that was published, uh, some evidence emerging for stimulants for the treatment of stimulant use disorder, and um, you know, mixed evidence also for topiramate, modafinil, and sometimes secondary analysis will show as well that works better in this subgroup if they're absent in a treatment entry or in this other subgroup if they have higher use at treatment entry. So uh, keeping that all in mind, there's been numerous, this is not a comprehensive list of negative trials for methamphetamine use disorder, multiple categories of medications studied, many negative study, may, many negative findings. We may have missed some signals because we're learning that a large proportion of study participants aren't necessarily adhering to the study medication, and that wasn't always carefully monitored. Um, and it's such a heterogeneous group that we may miss signals in some subgroups of individuals for whom maybe the medication could be effective. But this is an example of a study of bupropion that was an, an overall negative trial, but when they actually looked at the proportion of participants that were adherent to the study medication based on plasma levels in that adherent subgroup, there was a significant difference in 
uh, methamphetamine abstinence between the medication group and placebo. I'm going to go quickly through these so we have discussion time. Mirtazapine, there have been, as I mentioned, a couple of studies. This is a figure from the more recent Coffin publication in 2019, a randomized controlled trial um, in, a, in a specific population outlined here, comparing mirtazapine 30 milligrams versus placebo on a platform of counseling. And they used a, a novel um, adherence monitoring mechanism called wise pill to, to actually look at med adherence and found about 40% adherence. And we, you know, we like to target higher adherence, but we're learning that uh, adherence is a real issue with, with medications. And they found that there was a significant reduction in positive urine drug screens in the mirtazapine group at all time points. That is uh, depicted with the orange line. I'm not going to go cover all the bullets here. There was a study conducted by Walter Ling um, looking at methylphenidate for methamphetamine use disorder titrated to 54 milligrams per day. And there were some mixed findings, um, but the methylphenidate group had significantly fewer self-reported days of meth use during the treatment period than placebo in those who had more than 10 days of use at baseline. So Again, this idea that there may be different treatment effects or outcomes in groups that are heavier users at baseline versus um, less heavy use at baseline, but there was no difference in urine drug screen results. There's been a series of work done on naltrexone, which as I mentioned earlier, is approved for opioid use disorder, approved for alcohol use disorder, and uh, some, some work led to a, a pilot trial first done by NIDA CTN looking at open label extended release naltrexone and bupropion extended release at 450 milligrams per day, showing a, a signal of effect responders in the way that they, they defined response in that study followed by a more recently published randomized control trial, also through NIDA Clinical Trials Network published by Trivedi. The combination yielded significant response relative to placebo. This was a, a really interesting study done over two phases, 12 weeks, where there was an initial group randomized to, and the naltrexone was actually given every three weeks, the injection, um, and, Bupropion at 450, replicating that component of the pilot study. They were randomized to medication combination versus placebo. And then in those who didn't respond in the placebo group, they were re-randomized to in a one-to-one -one ratio of medication versus placebo. And what's shown in this figure from the publication is that the, the response rates were, you know, fairly low in terms of actual percentage of response, you know, stage one in medication group 16.5, stage two, 11.4, but were significantly improved relative to placebo. And then they, they calculated this weighted average across the two stages and the treatment effect was essentially the difference between the weighted average. And that was 11.1 percentage points. So again, viewing this as a tool number needed to treat was nine, similar to some other medications that are used um, across psychiatry and really just one of our, one of our options that, that we have now for a medication off-label option for, for methamphetamine use disorder. So for clinical management considerations, I wanna to shift to questions. I mentioned some of the things that I think about when choosing medications. I really wanna be proactive in treating comorbidity and um, certainly in an ED setting, we can see agitation, we can use medications to treat withdrawal symptoms. We want to always refer patients to evidence-based behavioral treatment for their stimulant use disorder because that is um, our, our best tool. 
many of the studies for medications suffer from um, being underpowered, high attrition rates. There's a, a review paper by Chan and another one more recently published that um, meta-analysis that that really breaks down some of the best medication options that we have based on the evidence in the literature uh, related to bupropion stimulant-based medications, topiramate, if there's a negative urine screen at baseline. This is a summary of some of the dosing of these medications that can be considered. Really, they've been um, titrated in studies to target doses with methamphetamine more recently in combination with naltrexone. The bupropion is actually at 450 milligrams per day, but otherwise they've mostly been studied at standard doses, topiramate 300, mirtazapine 30, methylphenidate 54. Uh, some might say we've underdosed in medication trials we might do better with higher doses. And of course, thinking about safety considerations. Important for our patients who are using methamphetamine to think about naloxone because methamphetamine is now often found with fentanyl, uh, laced with fentanyl, or individuals are co-using intentionally with fentanyl. And so, we're really moving to just prescribe or recommend provide education on naloxone for even our methamphetamine only patients, whether or not we're aware that they're co-using with opioids because of this potential overdose fatality and whether or not they're continuing to use methamphetamine, I continue them on their medication treatment for opioid use disorder sometimes get questions about, well, should you just stop it? They're, they're relapsing. Is there a danger? They're still safe for being on the buprenorphine, methadone, uh, naltrexone, because using the full agonist opioids confers such a higher risk of overdose mortality. But really try to screen for fentanyl and um, add it to your urine drug testing if you can. So summary of treatment implications, prescribe naloxone for overdose prevention in this population, combine medication treatment for opioid use disorder with contingency management if possible or other, other evidence-based treatment interventions like CBT, community reinforcement approach, um, assess and treat psychiatric comorbidity, and think about other options, even if they're less robust, like recommending exercise, it's healthy. It may help with reduction to relapse and also depression and anxiety. Think about if you have access to, this will vary by um, coverage and, and resources and programmatic access to digital therapeutics. There's some emerging evidence on the horizon, very, very early stage for TMS transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is uh, administered for treatment resistant depression, but now there's an interest in studying this in um, substance use disorders and some early evidence for that would say, you know, further study is warranted for stimulant use disorder. So those, those are my, my synthesized thoughts. And now we can move to questions. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Mooney. Um, let me just get up to the top of the questions. Um, and I, I was not able to monitor them while speaking. I apologize, but I'll be peeking at them now as we as we have this interaction. Yeah, there were a lot coming in. So I think the first one was, what are the recommendations for pregnant women and these um, OUD medications? That's a great question. Uh, the recommended treatment for opioid use disorder in pregnancy is either methadone or buprenorphine. For a very long time, gold standard was methadone because we had more data supporting its use. More recent studies have really supported the use of buprenorphine in pregnancy uh, to facilitate shorter length of stay and reduced um, severity of neonatal abstinence sym symptoms. These are safe medications in pregnancy and in uh, lactation as well, and much safer than untreated opioid use disorder in pregnancy. So I wouldn't recommend switching 
from one to the other, if a woman becomes pregnant while in treatment on methadone or buprenorphine, but have that informed discussion and um, that, that, that is the treatment that should be recommended. Great. And I also just want to repeat to everyone that the slides will be sent to you later today and there will be um, a recording of this made available later this week and I'll include that information in the email today as well. Okay, next question. Can you address your thoughts on plans to distribute, quote, clean opioids like hydromorphone to people at high risk of overdose? Yeah, there's, you know, really the more broadly speaking, harm reduction strategies that have been more widely implemented and accepted in countries outside of the United States. And we have to really turn to that literature and the public health experience of, of um, programs that have done this successfully. We tend to lag a bit in the U.S. on, you know, even accepting clean needle exchange, let alone supervised injection sites. I, I, I support the idea of meeting people where they're at and the utility of uh, anything that's safer than what they may be using on the street. If it can be monitored and administered safely and not everyone is ready for treatment at the same time, but these kinds of programs can be a resource, a harm reduction tool and, uh, and a place where people to come where they can also learn more about additional resources. But, but we've historically been very abstinence-based in our treatment approach for substance use disorders in general and slower to adopt some of the harm reduction strategies. Okay, what are the potential negative side effects for young adults being prescribed buprenorphine without recent use of opioids where recent use means longer than six months? Risks of prescribing, if I understood correctly, buprenorphine in a young person who's been using less than six months of opioids. If, if, if opioid use disorder has been established as a diagnosis, and especially given potent synthetics that are um, increasingly used and, and in the, the drug supply today, I still view it as safer to be on any of the medication treatments for opioid use disorder. If the person has not been, you, I've definitely seen some, some young people who have maybe used intermittently, been able to maintain abstinence for a period of time, and they really want to consider a non-agonist treatment like naltrexone, that might be a very good candidate. Uh, so I think it depends on what is their current severity of use, how are they using, what has their pattern of use versus abstinence been like? To, to guide what treatment you might recommend, but really informing them about all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one came in while you were talking about buprenorphine, but I think it probably applies to all the medications. Um, when do you complete the maintenance phase of being on these medications? How long until someone can be fully off the prescribed medication? Yes, uh, that's a, a very common question among clinicians as well as patients themselves. The vast majority of patients I've worked with ask this question and are curious about how long do I need to stay on the medication? My answer is that it, it varies. We don't have a very good way of predicting who can eventually come off the medication and coming off of the medication always has some degree of risk, namely relapse and overdose. So I, I try to incorporate, we also know that there's some data that we, we've, clinically met individuals um, or in our personal lives have met individuals who are on medication treatment and come off of it and stay abstinent for years. We're just not good at predicting who those people are. And, um, but many of my patients will want to try to taper. I, that's not really my agenda because I also have seen very successful long-term maintenance use of these medications. If someone has resumed their functioning, they're going on with their daily lives, feeling well, feeling at their, their baseline, that is success to me, um, as opposed to a goal of coming off the medication by a certain time. But over, over time, finding the lowest effective dose, many times patients on buprenorphine over the years can successfully get onto lower and lower doses and still feel very stable, also have protection from the medication. And, and really in a patient-centered way, supporting them through that journey and um, 
if they if they want to have a trial off, sometimes there are approaches where you can taper low on the buprenorphine and then eventually use supportive medications and even transition to injectable naltrexone as a strategy. So then they still have medication on board, but they're protected. And, and it's, it's really case by case, but these are viewed as most effective when used as longer term maintenance medications. However, knowing that some people do eventually successfully come off of them. Okay. Someone also asked if you could explain a little bit more about what you mean by induction rate when you're talking about OED medications. I simply mean getting the person onto the medication. I apologize, I should have defined that more clearly. Uh, you could say for buprenorphine versus uh, really all three, all of the approved medications that we talked about today, buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone have different approaches to help patients get on them. With, with methadone, it's just essentially starting it and then slowly going up on the dose. With buprenorphine, it's usually, except in some other strategies like microinduction, starting the medication after a, some opioid withdrawal symptoms have emerged. And in naltrexone, it's supporting individuals through a period of opioid free, they have to have no opioids in the system to get onto the medication. So it's, it's, it's another term for initiation of medication, but with the idea that there's slightly different strategies to do that induction. Interesting. Um, so here's another question. Uh, the person says, this is off topic as it's not about methamphetamine, but we are seeing Kratom utilized more and more in place of meth, especially in terms of trying to stop opioid use without medications. Any thoughts on Kratom? Yeah, that's a great question. I've, I've definitely seen um, quite a bit of Kratom. It's uh, available for purchase. There's some controversy about whether it should be um, made illegal or, or, you know, scheduled, but, um, it's a medication. It's a Kratom is a, a, a plant that you, you, that has some stimulant properties, but also weak opioid properties. People use it in teas and different, different ways of administering it, but it's commonly purchased to, for that exact purpose, for people to sort of self detox. However, we've seen plenty of cases of primary kratom addiction, and then we treat it like um, opioid use disorder with other weak opioids like tramadol. Tramadol is weaker, but some people end up preferring tramadol. So there are some case reports showing um, benefit and use of buprenorphine for people who have a dependence on kratom. We've used it also successfully, and the average dose range tends to be a bit lower. And that's true in the, in the reports that I've seen in the literature, like between eight and 12 milligrams. So um, I, I've definitely heard of people successfully using and tapering off Kratom or using it to get off of other opioids on their own, but sometimes not able to then come off of the Kratom. Okay. Um, in terms of contingency management, there was a lot of discussion in the chat about how difficult it is to get funding for that. Um, I wondered if you had any comments on, on that or ways that people might approach getting funding that might be more successful for them. I, my, my sense is that, and I'm not, I'm not an expert, expert in what's going on at all the you know, policy and legislation level, but there's a lot of movement in this area, pressure coming from leading um, addiction societies, ASAM, AAAP, who have advocacy groups, trying to get the word out. And again, with this Biden-Harris support for contingency management, I'm hopeful that one of the issues is that reimbursing only through Medicaid at a $75 cap, the evidence shows that having slightly higher reward amounts is more effective. Um, so depending on the coverage, there, there are ways to get it reimbursed and it's gonna vary by region and by plan. Um, but I think what we have to do is keep the, the policy and advocacy momentum because the data really supports it. And the concern has been if we give patients more than you know, $75, there's room for uh, fraud in the system. And then, you know, will they, will they use the money for other things? There's been different kinds of 
concerns and controversy around it. The VA has adopted it at the national level and has funding, but this is what I mean by the variability. So start locally and see what's available, but then we need more policy broadly to, to change um, reimbursement in this area. Mm -hmm. And have you seen any research about the long-term effects of CM, whether it's affected over the long-term or, or what the um, relapse rates look like compared to other interventions? Yes, my, my understanding is that their earlier studies really focused on CM delivered for very short intervals, like three months, and then it didn't seem like the benefits extended beyond the active treatment phase, but when CM is administered, the, the plan itself for a longer time period, such as six months, which, which gives people more time to adopt new skills, build a new community, really develop their recovery plan, then the benefits can be more long lasting. And then in combination, there have been some other studies showing benefit in combination with um, CRA and C, um, CBT, where benefits have been demonstrated uh, at, at longer time points. But what we want to do is give people tools, make have the plan be long lasting enough for them to actually make lifestyle changes and gain new skills and new supports so that they can maintain their gains. We want to build that foundation of um, abstinence that allows the individual to maintain it over time. Have you seen any studies looking at early age of onset with methamphetamine use? Um, the person says, what I have observed is the earlier someone starts when the brain is more elastic, the less successful any treatment is. It seems almost hopeless, they said. Yeah, that's um, uh, what, what I can say is broadly across substance use disorders, we know that early age of onset of substance use is often a predictor for risk of use disorder later in life. Adolescence is a time of brain development. We know this is also true for cannabis use disorder. You know, early onset use is um, often a risk factor for later or earlier development of a use disorder and, and um, you know, less ability to control use. Okay, um, and next question, someone asked, should I refer my clients who are using methamphetamine alone and or with alcohol or opioids to medication treatment always? Methamphetamine alone or and, in combination with alcohol or opioids? Yep. Yes, um, I would, with a, with a clarification that we have approved medication treatments for alcohol and opioid use disorder. So in those cases, absolutely. But I, having um, an evaluation by a prescriber who's skilled in management of substance use disorders to think about what medications might be helpful in this patient with methamphetamine use disorder and use them as tools off label I would absolutely recommend it. Having that comprehensive evaluation to think about medications as a tool in combination with behavioral and other uh, treatments would be advisable, definitely. I think we have time for one more. Um, any studies or use of S-ketamine in treatment of OUD or MOD? Patients are asking for it even if they have no distinct major depressive disorder diagnosis. Um, there's emerging interest in ketamine broadly as a potential tr treatment that needs more study for addiction, meaning I'm saying broader substance use disorders. Um, a study combining a dose of ketamine with a, with a behavioral treatment intervention for cocaine, for example, and, and some, I would just say very, very early data but nothing too robust showing potential um, utility of ketamine in, in reducing relapse in other substance use disorders as well. But we, we definitely need to weigh risks and benefits, think about them carefully, and it just needs more study before we can recommend it um, as a treatment for substance use disorder and, and also acknowledge that some, in, you know, it has its own 
potential for misuse and and even um, use disorder. So right now it's you know proof for for depression, treatment resistant depression, and I agree with you that I'm seeing more individuals seeking ketamine for all sorts of reasons. Um, also using being used widely for pain, but very, very early stages in terms of some of the other data. Great. Um, okay. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Mooney, for that great presentation. And again, I'll be sending the slides out in probably 20 minutes. And also special thanks to our two ASL interpreters, Karen and Annette, who were so great today. Thank you for coming and um, have a great day, everybody.